You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jillian Cantor. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories, bringing you the very best author interviews from the best writers writing today. I'd like to thank some sponsors today that make the show possible. Patricia Gillum, A Superhero's Duty, a fight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the deaths of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city aren't out of danger. A Superhero's Duty by Patricia Gillum. There's a link to it in the show notes. I'd also like to tell you about my friend Crystal Pico Watanabe of Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. Visit Crystal and her team of eight people who help her provide services to fiction authors. Crystal's full slate of services now include beta reading, manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors, you can also inquire about putting your books in her Book Lover's Box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. This is free for authors for a limited time. PicosHouse.com for all your book publishing needs. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jillian Cantor on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book called In Another Time. Uh, I've had this book for a couple of weeks now, and it is absolutely phenomenal. I know you guys are really going to love it. Uh, welcome to the show, Jillian. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, You know, the first, my first experience with fiction, I was in fourth grade. So I was nine and I had a teacher that year and she assigned us in the beginning of the year. We had to write a short story every week, the whole year. Um, I don't think there was any other prompt other than that. It just had to be fiction. So that was my first experience writing fiction, and I loved it. Um, I remember I wrote one story that my mom saved that I got an A-plus on. It was about two sisters that had a secret, and it's funny because even all these years later, I'm always writing about sisters and secrets. Um, So I was always a big reader before that. You know, I loved to read. I I was reading whatever I could get my hands on, but that was the point where someone asked me to actually write creatively. So that's pretty clear in my mind that's awesome you know um ray bradbury who is a big proponent of short story writing uh, encouraged people to write a short story every week and then you know at the end of a year uh, it would be impossible to write 50 bad short stories and <laughs> I, I wonder if that teacher was uh was a bradbury fan yeah that's interesting i have no idea and i'm, I'm not even sure why i don't remember why she asked us to do it or what we were even learning i just remember every sunday all year sitting down to write some kind of a short story that's amazing um were you a big reader yeah definitely i mean i was i was always reading um i used to spend my entire summer vacations reading my mom used to take me and my sister to the library and i think you could check out like 10 books at the time that was the limit and i would check out my 10 and then i would be ready to go back two days later and i was always begging her to take me back to the library <laughs> <laughs> what were um what were some some stories or uh or genre that just really captured your imagination that maybe you kept going back to over and over again um you know, I remember being a big fan of, of mysteries. You know, I loved Nancy Drew very early on. I read all of those. And um, even pretty early in elementary school, I remember reading um, the mystery books that my mom was reading. I would I would take them from her room. Um, and I remember reading all of Stephen King maybe in, like, fourth or fifth grade. 
Um, and then I would say probably the first historical novel that I remember reading is Gone with the Wind. Um, I think I was in like fifth or sixth grade at the time, and my family went on vacation, and I remember my mom gave it to me for my birthday, and I took it with, with me. And that was sort of the first time I was caught up in another era in a book, and I loved it. That's fantastic. Um, and, and we're going to talk all about historical fiction in yeah. just a minute, but what, what do you think it was about mystery that, uh, that intrigued you so much? Um, you know, I mean, I think even still, I, 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 you know, don't really read the mystery genre so much anymore, but I, I think even still I'm always interested in plot, and I like um, sort of like a well-paced book where I can't figure everything out. And I think that's what interested me about mystery too. Not you know not knowing what was going to happen at the end, or trying to figure out what was going to happen at the end as I was reading it. And that's you know as an adult now I know that's true in a lot of genres. But yeah. as a kid, I think that's what I was drawn to. Well, there's definitely an air of mystery in in a lot of your work, um, and uh, the I, I could definitely tell that that you're a fan of those types of stories because um, there's. You know, there's a you have a way with plotting that keeps the pages turning. Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, I I hope so. That's always my goal. You're right. Um, as you as you grew older, um, high school, and then on to college, did you um, did you know that you wanted to pursue writing? What was the um, what, what did you think you were going to do with your life? Um, so. You know, I, I didn't, in the beginning part of high school, I thought I was going to do something in science, um, like maybe go to medical school. <clears throat> I don't know why I thought this, but I, I got this idea in ninth or 10th grade, and I took this human anatomy class in 11th grade, and we had to dissect a cat, and that was just the end of, like, any like, belief nope. that I could ever go into medicine. No, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge cat person, so that was sort of the end of any aspirations, um, but then I thought, well, maybe I would do something in hospital administration. My senior year in high school, I took three science classes, I think. I don't I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but I also had a really great AP English class my senior year in high school and a great AP English teacher who was very creative and asked us to do a lot of creative writing. And I sort of remembered how much I loved it. And I decided I was going to major in English in college, but I thought I was going to go into journalism more. Um, and after my freshman year in college, I had a summer internship at a newspaper, um, and it was really, <laughs> I thought it was going to be a very exciting job, but it actually ended up being covering a lot of school board meetings, and <laughs> graduations, and I kept writing all these articles, and granted, it was not the most exciting topics, but I kept writing all these articles thinking, this would be so much more interesting if I could make some of these details up, which of course I couldn't do. And then I took a fiction writing class when I went back to college that fall. Um, so it was my sophomore year in college that I say I really seriously understood that I was going to write fiction. Yeah, it, it's bad when you're sitting in the uh, in, in the school board meeting to cover it and you're imagining a masked gunman come in or, or well, I wasn't, something. Well, it wasn't like going that far or anything, <laughs> but I just – and, you know, and I did have some other um, – other pieces. I mean, I remember covering a bunch of local interest stories, but I just felt so caught up in the details, and I realized this isn't what I enjoy about writing. You know, I enjoy the creative part of writing, and I I'd, I'd sort of forgotten about that over the years. Yeah. Um, when when you uh, kind of gave yourself permission to uh, to pursue creative writing, fiction writing, um, what was what were some of the first things that came to you that you wanted to stories that you wanted to tell? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. Um, you know, I I remember I wrote a story in college, and I think I might have used it for my grad school applications even. I wrote a story in college about um, my grandmother. Um, and I mean, it, it wasn't about her, but she had Alzheimer's in the last probably like 10 to 15 years of her life, and she had just sort of started to struggle with memory loss when I was in college, just a little bit. And I wrote a story um, about a woman sort of at the end of her life who was struggling with memory. Um, and then that actually went on to become a huge part of The Lost Letter, which was my last novel. Um, I'm trying to even remember what else I wrote about in college. Uh, you know, I remember I took a lot of 
fiction writing classes um, with one professor who was great, and she gave us a lot of directed um, prompts and exercises. And so I feel like I was probably mostly doing that in college. Gotcha. Um, so you you finished college. Um, what was the the first book that you that you wrote that got published, and what was the 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 catalyst to to pursue writing a novel? So I went to grad school after college. I got my MFA, um, and I I wrote a book while I was there for my thesis. And that book never got published. <laughs> so it was not that book. Um, but I, you know, I finished graduate school and I was teaching and I was trying to get an agent for that book for probably two or three years. And I got a lot of really, like, close calls, but I never actually um, signed with an agent. So I decided I was going to write another book. And I was probably, like, 25, 26 at that point. Um, and I, you know, I wrote it over a year. And then I looked for an agent again, and it took me almost two years, and I finally did get an agent. I still have the same agent today. So it was one of those cases of, like, having to match with the right person, and then um, it was a good match once once I did. Uh, But that novel eventually became um, a book called The September Sisters, and that was my first novel. When I wrote it, um, I thought I was writing an adult novel, but the narrator is a 13-year-old girl, And it was my agent who felt like it would work better as a young adult novel. So I ended up revising it, and it was published as a young adult novel. When um, when that book was published, um, you so well. First off, tell us what the story is uh, about the September Um, sisters. That's that's a novel about a thirteen year old girl. Her uh, younger sister disappears, um, and and it's sort of the story of what happens to her life as a result of her sister being missing and um it's not so much a mystery about what happens to the sister but more what happens to this girl abigail and her family without her sister gotcha um so uh that wound up being a young adult you thought you were writing an adult uh yes. novel what uh when getting that book out uh did you were you ever worried that uh okay if this is hugely successful. I'm going to be a young adult writer for the rest of my life. Um, but you know, was that something that you thought about? Um, and, and then how do you follow up that first book with your second? Um, no, that wasn't, I mean, I, I was never worried that it would be usually successful. I would have been thrilled if it is hugely <laughs> successful. Um, you know, I didn't, and so actually when I sold that book, I sold it in a two book deal. So I wrote another young adult book after that. Um, but I, as a writer, I don't really differentiate in my head between writing young adult or writing adult. It all feels like writing to me, and I, I enjoy I enjoy it equally. So um, I think my concern was just I wanted to do well. I want to continue my career. I don't want to just publish one book and then go away. Right. And, and that continues to be my concern <laughs> many years later. Gotcha. So what did you follow up that book with? Um, so my next book was called The Life of Glass, and that's about um, a 14-year-old girl whose father dies, and then sort of what happens to her her life after that. Gotcha. Um, when did this this thread of uh, historical fiction, uh, when did you uh, kind of hit on that and, and really find your niche? So Margot was my first novel of historical fiction, and it was published in 2013. Um, I started working on it, I think, in 2011, maybe 2000 and, 2010, 2011. Um, and I, I had the idea for the book first. I knew I wanted to write a novel about Anne Frank's sister, older sister Margot, and what would have happened if she had lived and had seen what had happened with Anne's diary. So I didn't set out intending to write historical fiction, but I knew it was going to have to be historical to tell the story that I wanted to tell. So I sort of fell into it that way. And then once I was in it, I realized how interested I was in writing about (laughs) historical fiction. Um, History was not a subject that I loved in school, to, to be honest. I, I was pretty bored by the history classes that I had to take in high school. But I realized once I started writing that there were so many women's stories that have largely been ignored by the history we're sort of forced to study in school. Right. And I was really interested in telling those. 
Well, you bring up a great point. Um, I think a lot of people are turned off by history um, by teachers that, um, and, and I don't want to denigrate teachers at all. Um, we love teachers and support teachers, yeah. but that you, you really need to have a passion for history. Um, and some, some teachers present it as dry and a list of facts and, uh, and don't connect with, with students. Um, so what is it, um, what is it that brings history alive, um, to people that makes us fall in love with, with historical novels that maybe we, uh, and, and, and then get to absorb things that we never got, you know, in school. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think it is that, that, that makes it click with us? I mean, I think for me, it's thinking about women who were like me, who were living in a different time. So, you know, mothers and daughters and sisters and who were, for the most part, just ordinary women and what they do when they're faced with extraordinary circumstances. And that's what draws me in as a writer and as a reader, too. Um, And sort of thinking about how your life would have been different if you were born in a different time or in a different place in a different historical circumstance. And, yeah, clearly I just I never had the right teacher in high school for history. (laughs) I mean, I, I think if I had taken maybe... Um, even a class that focused on the women or feminist history, I probably would have loved it. Right. Um, when you start looking at a time period or um, I, I guess let, let me ask it this way. When you begin a book, when a story comes to you, um, what usually comes first? Is it a character? Is it a setting? Um, is it a plot point? Is it some uh, historical uh, you know, interesting fact that you come along and then, and, and how does the story evolve out from there for you? Um, you know, usually it's the character. Usually I'm, I start with the character and I feel like that's always the most important thing for me, but sometimes it is like a historical fact or, um, uh, for in another time, um, I, I was, I, I, I sort of knew, you know, what I was going to do, but then I came across an article online about a violinist who had been saved in a concentration camp because he could play violin, and then after the war, he became a concert violinist. And so that sort of inspired the idea for Hannah um, in, in another time. So I guess it was partially like historical fact in that situation, partially the character, Usually the setting I figure out last, unless it's something very, you know, very specific. Um, but the setting usually is something I have to I have to work on after I know the characters and the plot points. Gotcha. Um, you've written um, about five uh, historical novels now. Is that right? Um, in another time, will be my fourth one. Yeah, that's gotcha, fourth one. Okay. Um, what is it that uh, like what? What is it about this time period specifically um, that you love so much? We, we seem to be seeing um, a good many um, historical novels that are coming out around the 30s and 40s and, and this kind of World War II time period. And, and I am super happy about that. I, I think the, the farther we get away from a historical event, we start losing the, you know, the, the reality of those things. And, and historical events tend to be, um, you know, reduced down to, bullet points and, yeah. and and we lose the the how and the why and the you know all of that uh, what is it about this time period that that you love so much you know i think there are so many stories to tell that haven't been told yet that are fascinating to me um and it's it's sort of a recent enough history where you can talk to people that were still alive at that time but it's far enough where we don't really know it as well as we should and so, and I also feel like it's it's starting to slip away more. You know, a, a lot of the survivors of the Holocaust um, aren't with us any longer. And so I feel like it's important to sort of keep those stories alive, to keep people aware of that history and to make sure it's known. Um, but it's just, I don't even know that I in, I've intentionally gone back to that. It's just sort of what's interesting me what i want to know more about i actually my novel the hours count is set in the 50s and it's um it's it's about the rosenbergs and you know mccarthyism and stuff um but but that sort of intrigued me for the same reason it was 
it was recent enough history, but it still is something that people don't know about as much as they should today. Right. Right. When um, when you, you find a historical fact and, and a, a person that kind of jumps out to you and, and you want to know, know more about their story, um, how long does it take you to, to, to know if there's a novel in there? Um, you know, it, it varies. Sometimes I sit down and I write and I know it's a novel right away, but then there's other times where I write 50 pages thinking I'm writing a novel and then I just think, I can't do this, this is not a novel. So I don't know that there's always one specific answer. Um, the project I'm working on right now, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about because I haven't even told it yet, <laughs> but I've started it over three times and so, you know, I've, I've I've written the first 75 pages three different ways, and I'm finally at the point where I feel like, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. This is a novel. But in another time, um, I was actually writing a book before in another time. I stopped about 60 pages in, um, and I got the idea for another time, and that was one of those stories where it was like I knew what it was going to be about, and I was able to sit down and write up the whole first draft in a few months. Uh, And it's, it's largely now how it was after that. I mean, I, I revised it, of course, but the structure is largely how it was in that first draft. Isn't it funny how that happens? Sometimes you're 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 well into a project, and it may or may not be going well, or at least you think going well, and then this this almost inspired idea hits you, and then and the the difference in working on that project and the one you were working on is just night and day and you're like oh god this is the thing this is yeah, the thing yeah my first my first draft of in another time the file on my computer is saved as this crazy idea i had that's that's how it remained titled on my computer for the first 20,000 words and then i finally admitted no wait this is really the book i'm writing i should probably <laughs> change this file name <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, never delete that. Mm-hmm. that is, so in another time, um, we should tell everybody it's out now. Uh, when you're hearing this, it's available, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in hardcover and in Kindle edition. It's out in audiobook. Um, however you like to consume books, you can, you can get it in your preferred format. Um, but tell us about, uh, about Hannah and Max, the, the two characters that we meet in this book. Sure. So um, Hannah is uh, sort of a violin prodigy. Hannah and Max are living in in Germany in the early 1930s. Hannah is a violin violinist, concert violinist, um, and then Max owns a bookshop. He um, his father recently passed away, and he sort of inherited the store. So Max runs this bookshop outside of Berlin, and Hannah plays violin. Hannah is Jewish. Max is not. Uh, they meet in the first chapter of the novel, um, and they start to fall in love. And this is early 1930s, before Hitler's come to power. But over the course of the book, Hitler will come to power, and and they'll change. Everything will change for them, of course. You, uh, the, the book follows them and their story um, across multiple continents. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you decide? Um, you mentioned earlier about the the um, uh, the idea that you had heard about the the violinist, um, but um, at, at what point when you're writing this do you um, uh, are you weaving these characters into historical facts that you know, and at what point does it just kind of become a, a story that you're following along as the writer? Um, I feel I feel like in this story in particular, it was sort of the the characters that I made up and their story that drove me more than the historical facts. You know, um, I got their story down and the structure of the story down before I even weaved a lot of those facts in. Um, So the book is structured, so you see Max narrates the chapters in the 1930s in Germany, and then Hannah narrates the chapters after the war, and it goes back and forth in time between those two places. Before the war, we see Max's point of view. After the war, we see Hannah's point of view. And after the war, Hannah isn't sure what happened to her for 10 whole years, and she doesn't know what happened to Max. Um, so I was really... Um, it was sort of a complicated structure to write, and I was making lots of maps and charts of where everyone was at which time, because I needed to sort of know that in both stories. 
and that was my main focus for the first for the first draft. Um, once I had all of that in place, then I started to figure out exactly what what was going on around them. Hannah moves to London pretty quickly to live with her older sister. Um, and so, so all the details in the book about what London was like and then Paris when she moved to Paris, all of that came later in subsequent drafts. That had to be a lot of fun writing the, the two viewpoints and the, and the two time periods. Um, and, and I can see those threads of, uh, the love of mystery coming in there where you're, yeah. you're getting to, you know, to take the different view and, oh, uh, what happened here? Well, let me, let me, let me clue the, um, the reader in from this perspective and then completely flip it over to this perspective. That had to be a lot of fun to write. It was a lot of fun. It really, it really was. I mean, it was really exciting to work on it every day. And I sort of got to the point where I wasn't talking to my family because I was just like in the <laughs> writing zone for a while. But at a certain point, I think I was about 100 pages in, and I just said, I have to stop and make a timeline. And so I still have it on the wall in my office. I have this timeline that goes from 1931 to 1960, and I have every single year and what each character was doing in each year, because the, the book doesn't unfold linearly like that, but I needed to know that for my own sanity, I think. Um, so it was a lot of fun. It was a lot easier once I made that big chart for myself. So I knew what everyone was doing at what time and with whom. Right. Um, are you, are you typically a, uh, a plotter or, or a discovery writer? Um, do, do you plan the book out ahead of time? I know this one kind of evolved organically, um, from the, the way, from what you're telling me. Um, but is that your normal writing process? Um, you know, normally I, I, I know a beginning point and an ending point, but I don't usually know how I'm going to get to the end until I actually write it. And of course, that requires me to revise a lot at the, you know, at the end. Um, but I like to know some direction. You know, I like to know what I'm going towards. But if I know every single thing, I feel I tend to get bored as I'm writing. And part of the excitement for me is discovering it as I go and thinking about it as I go. So most of my books generally unfold that way. And you talked about stopping about 100 pages in and, and creating that timeline and like, mm -hmm. okay, now I, I kind of know what the story is. Now I need to, to make right. sure people are in the right places. Um, is is that a tool that you that you use often or or, or have other books required um, that you kind of stop in the middle and, and, and do a little um, logistics work or um, – yeah, or do you wait till you get to the end and then go back and, and fix uh, places and times and things like that? Yeah, I mean, if I have a, a book with multiple points of view and um, multiple characters and multiple timelines, then I do feel like I have to stop at a certain point and get the logistics down. Um, if it's more of a, a just a straightforward one point of view, then it, it is something that I, I would probably do at the end just to make sure I have everything um, but it's it's just when it gets too much for me to remember it from day to day, and and it's a, and in other time spans thirty years, and so I can't <laughs> I couldn't keep straight where everyone was when without <laughs> looking at my chart. <laughs> right, right. Um, I think that in another time is your eighth uh, published novel. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Um, yeah. After after eight books, um, do do you find that you have uh, any particular daily writing habits? Um, do you, uh, you know, do you set daily word counts for yourself, or is it kind of uh, a per project basis where maybe you take some time off when you're when you're not working on a new project? You, like, what is your your daily habit? So if I'm if I'm drafting a book, I try to write five pages every weekday. That's sort of my um, you know my goal in general. But I, I don't I don't write five pages every day. You know, if I don't have a project that I'm working on, um, I'll do something else. I'll I'll read a book or I'll read research or I'll um, you know right now I'm doing some publicity stuff. Um, and I, I generally work during the weekdays when my kids are at school, you know, eight to three, that's sort of my general schedule. And if I'm writing, then I have a writing goal for myself that day that I have to get done. If I'm not in the middle of a project, then I have, you know, some other kind of writing related thing that I do. 
Um, and, it, you know, it changes, too. In the beginning of a book, that's always the hardest for me. That's when I have to force myself to write those five pages. Once I get closer to the end, sometimes I'll sit down and I'll get, like, 20 pages in a day. And, and I'll have to go back the next day and edit because there'll be so many mistakes and it'll be terrible. But that's when I sort of pick up steam. Um, yeah, but, I mean, I, I think it just probably, like, depends what part of the process I'm in. It's uh, it's really weird how that uh, it it feels like work a lot of times in that begin in those beginning stages when you're just learning the characters yeah, and and the, and the story it's almost like you're pushing the story uphill, uh, but there always comes that point where you you top the hill and then you you jump in the cart with the characters and you're just riding along with them. Um, it's you know it, like every writer has that story. It's amazing how that happens. Yeah, and it's hard to remember from book to book. I mean, I start over again, and then every time I think, I don't remember how to do this. Um, so it's, it's, it's like you sort, of, you sort of forget about the process. It's weird, but then I get to that good part again, and I remember why I love it. Right. Right. Well, and, and your love absolutely shows in, in another time. This oh, book's fantastic. Um, it's out everywhere now. Um, there's links to it in the show notes. Um, Jillian, if people are just learning about you and your work and want to find out more about you, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Sure. I have a website. It's just JillianCantor.com. Um, I'm on every social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I think I'm just at Jillian Cantor pretty much everywhere. Excellent. And we're going to send everybody to see you and to pick up their copy of In Another Time. Uh, Jillian, I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Um, we're going to send everybody to see you. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I'm melting! I'm melting! cried Joey. Take the picture already! He stood with one arm around the bronze waist of the bewitched tribute statue, Samantha Stevens, riding a broom across a crescent moon. Jason tried in vain to frame the shot without any tourists in it, but that was impossible. From all points of the compass, a merry horde had arrived for Salem's two-day summer psychic fair. All the commuter trains had burst open, like cornucopias filled beyond capacity, spilling endless fruits and nuts onto the red brick sidewalks of Essex Street. A vampiress in lavender shorts and feathered boots sold maple chocolate walnut fudge in front of the Witch City Tattoo Parlor. A near-naked gypsy in purple-green veils danced with a pheasant in her arms around a plug-in Hanukkah menorah. A fat man in a fetching blue jeans dress sold amethyst and citrine charm bracelets in front of Medusa Cafe, but his stand got knocked over by a one-armed crone driving a mobility scooter who sang, Choo-choo! as she passed, her stump on the wheel, her lipstick ghastly, her gnarled right hand raised in trailing plumes of noxious cigarette smoke. Chewbacca leapt out of her way and slapped sparks from his fur. He gave a disgruntled growl before going back to playing summer lovin' on his ukulele. The old one-armed dervish drove off, choo-choo, parting a crowd of wanderers, slack-jawed tourists with camera straps tight across their bellies, yellow-vested police on segways, elderly rollerbladers, face-painted infants and harried parents, and college girls. So many hot, hysterical college girls that you'd think somebody had napalmed a sorority house. Jason, are you deaf? Sorry. Jason raised the phone and took the shot. Joey inspected the photo and nodded in approval. Your turn. No, thanks. Do it, Shaggy. Don't make me hex you. Jason gave in and traded places. He put an arm around Samantha's metal back. Her bronze body had flushed in the afternoon sun, Warm through his glove, but her eyes were weary. No, downright creepy. And her smile was forced, like a Disneyland princess who'd had her toe stomped. Say chowda, cried Joey, who'd been practicing his New England accent all morning. Come on, man. Say chowda. Fine, chowda. Joey got the shot and Jason surrendered Samantha to a chubby kid wearing a Gandalf beard who climbed up to worship her bronze bosom.